everyone else every broker knew every other broker and on the ring he felt there was absolutely no need to manage any risk and surprise of surprises every few years we had a scam so if i told you that we actually carried suitcases of share certificates on delivery date or that after sending share certificates for a transfer you would get half of them rejected after another 60 days or that you cannot predict when you would get your funds or securities you'd certainly think i'm exaggerating but that was the markets in the late 80s why am i saying this because today where we are has no relationship with where we were and if that had to happen some paradigm changes had to take place some game changers were required it was fortuitous that nsc had the opportunity to be the instrumentality in that game change in fact when the small team came together which included me in the 90s early 90s our mandate was as simple as we need to transform the market our mandate was as simple as that it was open it was left to us to paint that canvas nobody told us go get more products go improve the technology go deepen the markets no those were all instrumentalities what would what were what did we set out to do we set out to do all that it takes to transform the market since the mandate was so wide the visioning and the missioning was all very simple the vision was very simple you just had to be aligned to your basic dharma which was am i doing something which is going to deeply impact markets which is going to completely change the way markets are hitherto functioning how were markets hitherto functioning non transparent no semblance of best practices and last but not the least all the stakeholder interests were not taken care of in fact jocularly people used to say stock exchanges were for the brokers by the brokers and of the brokers and it was very close to the truth mind you so stakeholders of the exchange were beyond just the intermediaries and every stakeholder's interests had to be balanced and taken care of so in this exercise we had to question the basic principles or basic paradigms which is that the broker was not the center of the universe in the stock exchange the investor indeed was the center of the universe the broker was the facilitator most importantly there were also issuers of capital and it was our business to ensure that they could raise capital at the right time at the right cost we were also at a point in time when the markets had suffered a huge crisis of confidence because we had just about gotten out of the harshad mehta scam at that point of time so what should be our guiding principle and as we delved deeper and deeper into what should be our guiding principle really only two thoughts came to us or in fact it boiled down to one which is how do we inspire confidence back into the market infrastructure one modality was to ensure that we have a fair play and all stakeholders have an equal opportunity of their interests being served how do you do that 
the whole concept of demutualization which we see today in stock exchanges. Very simply put, the brokers don't manage the stock exchanges anymore and brokers are just users of the stock exchange like the companies and like the investors and the exchanges are professionally managed. This is what today we all uh, you know, recognize and appreciate as demutualization of stock exchanges. That seemed to be one instrumentality by which you could bring that kind of a fair play into the market. In fact, India was the second exchange, NSE was the second exchange in the world to look at demutualization at that point of time. Uh, many other so-called developed markets hadn't embarked on that journey yet. So, think about this from the team's perspective. Here you are thinking about how to bring a perception of fairness, how to be seen to be fair and how to be fair in fact. And you're convinced that demutualization is the way to go. But on the other hand, think about what empirical evidence do you have to go and convince anybody in policy or anywhere else to say, no, no, this is really the way to go? Not much. Now, this is where staying close to your mandate and staying close to your basic convictions helped the team. We were convinced that without this, we would be just another exchange. And we needed this if we had to make a difference or if we had to make an impact. So, we brought in demutualization as a basic assumption in our business model. The exchange had to be a demutualized exchange from day one. The second principle, in fact, you know, Dr. Partle, who was our first MD, he would always say, we are like umpires. And we have to ensure that we are seen to be empire, uh, like umpires and we built credibility like umpires. So what this really meant is the whole market framework had to be as objective and rule bound as possible. This was completely a deviation from how markets operated before that. The minute you are rule bound there is very little room for discretion, judgment, favoring X, favoring Y, etc., etc. In the beginning, in fact, we used to be called a Sarkari exchange. We used to be called a Babu exchange, you know. And it actually fitted in very well because we were all Babus in one way, you know. We all came from an institutional background, so it was very apt to call us Babus. But the good news is that we didn't carry the service inefficiencies of Babudam, if I may put it that way. And so soon brokers realized that it's better if these guys are objective and dispassionate because if they don't favor me today, they will not favor anyone else either tomorrow. That brought, you know, in a very simple way, a lot of credibility into the system. So what I'm saying is that sometimes, you know, you make these leap of faith, you know, you, you think that the demutualization is really what is going to give you that uh, uh, fairness and credibility and being rule bound is really what is going to help you. You don't know at that point of time and only when you look back, you see that there is a flip side to it and if you manage the flip side, then you really get what you want. In fact, the the journey of, you know, creating the exchange, again, it's not important, you know, whether we picked the right products on day one, whether we did the right business development efforts, but what I will say is the process is my learning. None of us had domain expertise, believe me. All the five of us who came into the team, none of us had any business or domain expertise. We just came because we felt that this was something of a great opportunity to make an impact. This was an opportunity to make an impact and change something which will contribute for posterity. In the process, we decided we could learn just about anything. So when we came, it was a great starting point because we were hungry to learn. 
we went out and met hundreds of brokers and hundreds of investors across India because we felt we just had to hear everybody. That was the only way we could quickly grasp what was the, what was the customer saying, what is the ground reality, what is the scope. It helped us keep a very open mind. It also helped us take completely out of the box solutions. Probably if we had experience or if we had knowledge, we may have been more skeptical about some of the things that we did. The other good news was that since our domain expertise was so poor, the people whom we engaged with in the market never took us seriously. They felt, ye lo kya kar lenge? I mean, they are just a bunch of guys who are trying to learn the market. It was great because the expectations were not that high. Now, why is this important? When I look back, I feel you can take a lot of risks and you can actually experiment with a lot of things if you do it under the radar. If ahead of time there is a hype around the ideas, it puts so much more pressure on institutions to experiment or to innovate for that matter. In fact, you know, if you, if you have to ask me to describe what the environment used to be at that point of time, one was a complete college learning atmosphere because here we were, you know, by the day gathering information. And second, a true sense of entrepreneurship because we felt we have to take what risks we have to because we have to make this succeed. I'll give you an example of, you know, what kind of risks we had to take. As you know, you know, when we started the exchange, we had to figure out where do we get our members from, right? Bombay was a very well entrenched kind of a location. Going after the same brokers who are already so powerful, already so wealthy, etc., etc., and who anyway poo pooed the idea in the first place, is not much of a chance, right? So, that brutal fact forced us to think what else can we do. It mapped very well with the feedback we got from outside Bombay. We got feedback from many places outside Bombay that there was so much latent demand for people to become first generation broker entrepreneurs and they found no way of being able to access the markets directly. Because in those days, the seats used to be auctioned. There were limited number of seats. And you couldn't just walk in and, you know, ask for a membership of any exchange. So, this whole pool of professional, qualified, you know, uh, capitalized members were out there, not being able to start careers in broking. This mapped very well. And so we decided that in the first instance itself, we will go out and seek membership from outside Bombay. We must remember that the downside of this was there was really no active exchange outside Bombay. So all these guys are interested in taking membership, but are they really going to bring business tomorrow? We don't know, isn't it? We don't know. But it was a risk we had to take. The second decision, in fact, which also I would think was a high risk proposition was, you know, the same concept of selling seats meant that you always created a scarcity value around the business. It always created a, a great sense of demand around that business. But our feedback, our assessment and our you know, sense of economic efficiency made us think that you should not restrict access to any profession. If people qualify, they should be in a position to come into that business. And that's the only way the business will grow. So we decided that we will do away with this concept of cards. We will do away with this surplus rents, which hitherto exchanges were collecting. In fact, at the best of times, I remember a card sold for four crores on the erstwhile exchange. We said we will do away with this. 
we will not create any scarcity around the card concept. Whoever is eligible will come, put in his capital and start trading as long as he is eligible. We had no idea whether opening this up and making this such a free product would actually work for us or would actually put, peop put people off saying that, you know, you can get this anytime, what's the big deal? We don't have to queue up right now for a membership. It could have worked both ways. Good for us that both these decisions worked out well. But what I'm really trying to, you know, capture for you here is that along the way, there were several crossroads and there were several choices that any institution has to make. And unless that risk-taking ability is there in the people who run those institutions, who man those institutions, no pain, no gain, right? The, the third, uh, you know, feature that comes to my mind when, when we look at how we evolved over the years is that our teams have always had a sense of do whatever it takes to get the job done. What I mean is, the teams never had a choice of saying, I'm constrained by, you know, this policy uh, approval not coming in. I'm constrained by the engineer has gone on leave and I'm not able to put the cables together today. No, the constraints were there for us to overcome. Again, the most lucid example that comes to my mind is, you know, we had set out this mandate that this is a transparent, free market. Anybody in Manipal or in Kumarakum or in Gauhati should be able to access this market in the same way. That is what nationwide trading did for all the investors. But how do we make this a reality? And the only way we could make this a reality in the 1990s, when telecom was, you know, a generation older than where it is today, was through satellite communication. And none of the telecom providers at that point of time had large networks or were even willing to put this out for us. When we went and talked to the government, uh, the telecom, telecommunication ministry, they were totally mystified why somebody will want to set up a VSAT network for markets because hitherto the VSAT networks were for some defense and some other government applications. And they said, are you sure? And we said, yeah, we, we are quite sure this is what we want to do. And they actually allocated us a band which they don't use for any other operations. And since no telecom company by itself was ready to do all of this, we actually set up a team of telecom engineers who along with these companies will go out and set out this satellite network. So in short, we had to first become a telecom company before we became an exchange. But it's just that it never even crossed our mind that there was a choice. If you needed the exchange to be nationwide, then you have to set it up. So the do whatever it takes mindset always helps teams in pushing the envelope, in making things happen in any organization, irrespective of what business you are in. Lastly, it was part of our efforts in instilling confidence in the market that we wanted to say that if we commit to something, it is so, it will not change. Why am I saying this? I just uh, jocularly mentioned to you a little while ago that markets used to be T plus anything before uh, you know, the national market system came in. So when we started, we put in the discipline of putting out a settlement calendar in the beginning of the year, for the whole year. And we said, we will stick to this. Believe me, nobody in the community believed it. They said, ha ha, they've put some calendar, let us see. And the first settlement went through, the second settlement went through, 52 settlements went through like clockwork. That is when 
the community started to think, okay, if they commit to something, it looks like they will do it. In fact, there was a very interesting incident. We used to have our clearing house um, in downtown, and there was a mezzanine floor there, and people, you know, the, the, all these papers and share certificates used to come there, and overnight, our staff would count, separate them. It was a nightmarish operation. Suddenly, one day, between the pay-in and the pay-out, that is, the securities have come today and they have to go out tomorrow, tonight at 10 o'clock, the municipal authorities show up and say that this is an illegal construction and we have to break it down right now. So, uh, you know, there are about eight or ten junior officers sitting there and they asked them for a couple of hours' time. So the authorities said, we, we cannot really wait here for a couple of hours. We will do what we have to do, you do what you have to do. 